everybody, welcome to another episode of the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I'm Molly Herford, author and writer about kind of all different things fitness and nutrition related and lover of most things outdoors related, although not in the weather we've been having lately. And I'm Peter Glassford. I am a registered kinesiologist and an endurance coach, and I don't know, I'm okay with it. I've been really cold all weekend. Well, you're getting used to Canada still, I guess. You know, says the guy that was shivering at Pan Ams and had, I think, probably 10 different people come up to you and ask, aren't you Canadian? Um, I am, but I do like to move. I don't like standing. Yeah, we did have a very spectator-heavy weekend for us this weekend. I was at OFSA, which is Ontario's cross-country uh, like high school championship. I was there with the, uh, the team I've been coaching this season. And, you know, the team had a great day. Uh, it was very chilly, very muddy, very mucky, but they performed really well. I was super proud of a bunch of them. All of them, really. And then the next day we were at uh, the Pan American Championships of Cyclocross here in Midland. Yeah, yeah, it was good. Those races were super exciting. We also watched a wedding. Oh, yeah, we did watch a wedding. Um, that was not nearly as chilly. But somewhat athletic. We did a lot of dancing. That might have actually been our like peak athletic performance over the weekend. Yeah, I got in a run or two, two runs, uh, which was good. I did not, which was also good. I've been dealing with a little bit of a knee niggle, we'll call it. Like, not major pain, but just enough that I've, you know, elected to keep it a little chill this week and let it heal on its own. We've been working through it a bit. Yeah, you've gotten to practice your NKT stuff. Peter's a kinesiologist. and Yeah, so we've been doing a bit of m- muscle of- testing and just some... Molly really just needs to do some sort of warm-up usually or some cool-down. I don't think that's accurate. I'd like to strenuously disagree with that, even though it's probably actually quite accurate, but... You know, been still doing my normal morning routine, yoga, core, all that jazz, and walking a fair bit. Just have toned down the hour to 90 minute runs. And then what's going on uh, with Shred Girls? There's been some exciting news. Yeah, so anyone that's been, you know, listening for the last bit knows that I have the uh, Shred Girls series with the first book set to come out with uh, Random House this spring. Uh, So the official launch date of that is May 7th, 2019. But the very exciting thing for right this second is that you can pre-order it now on Amazon. So if you go to Amazon, you can search for either my name, Molly Herford, or you can search Shred Girls or Shred Girls Lindsay's Joyride is the title of the first book. I'm so excited with how the illustrations look, how the cover looks, Um, obviously with the writing, but since I did that, I can't be quite as excited. Sort of weird. It's nice. And I just I just tweeted that from your newsletter, there's discount codes for Shred Girl Schwag, which can tide people over till the May release of the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you want to find out those discount codes, you should head over to theoutdooredit.com and sign up for my newsletter there, where I tend to put a bunch of discount codes and other fun stuff, or go to the Shred Girl site and sign up for that newsletter. Uh, that one's going to have a discount code coming out pretty soon as well, so... Yeah, all great options. Um, pre-orders would be awesome. You know, the more pre-orders, the better the hype around the book is going to be, the more chance that it's going to reach a lot more, you know, a bigger audience of not just people who are already invested in cycling and already care about it, but actually get to people who, you know, maybe aren't at all interested in cycling and hopefully get them hooked. Right. Yeah, it's definitely something that's just sort of appeals to young young people hopefully Mm -hmm. right exactly all right so who do we have on today so we have luke humphrey on the show today who is both an accomplished coach and an accomplished marathon runner himself Um, so as an athlete he's qualified for the olympic trials twice already Uh, his personal best is 214 which is quite fast Uh, just like yeah a little fast yeah yeah uh, and then as a coach, he's coached hundreds of athletes. Uh, he works along with the Hanson brothers, who are also quite uh, popular in the marathon coaching world. If I was a better sound editor, I would totally be playing Mbop in the background right now. Well, I don't know if that's fair. They're probably sensitive to that, I guess. But um, yeah, <laughs> if, if we had better editing, I guess we could be like that. Uh, so yeah, so they've written a couple books already that are quite 
quite well known in terms of like, how do you do a marathon? These are the books you should read. Uh, mm-hmm. So Hansen's Marathon Method. Uh, and so this is sort of a follow up to that called Hansen's First Marathon, uh, which basically is going to take you, you know, maybe if you haven't run much and sort of what that does that process look like. And and more commonly, uh, if you've been a runner, maybe recreational or even dabbling in sort of fives, 10Ks, maybe the half marathon, uh, you know, this book's going to help you sort of deal with extending that fitness out longer, right? So you can sort of avoid injury and make sure that, you know, you got the pacing and nutrition nailed, right? So we we talk about a lot of those common pitfalls in injury and nutrition and pacing and too much too fast and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah. So even if you're not like planning your first marathon for next year or something, you guys still talk about just running philosophy in general and, you know, a lot of takeaways for someone who isn't necessarily just interested in a marathon right yeah i think you know this is sort of that coach to coach type episode we have sort of a variety of different episodes we do so this one's a little more theoretical even or coach to coach you know sort of back and forth on philosophy differences and you know general practices versus more specific applications for you know different people and how he differs from me or how you might approach two things differently so it was quite an enjoyable talk um for me as a coach but then also as an athlete, I think, you know, whatever you're doing, whether you're just cross training because the weather isn't great right now, or you want to try and get running, I think there's a lot of takeaways, with, even if you're not looking, you know, at that marathon specifically, um, or if you're looking at something like you are, like the ultra marathons, right? Mm-hmm. There, there's probably something there for you as well. Great. Um, and then just a quick warning, our recording equipment missed the first couple, about a minute of the talk. So. Yeah, it should be okay. We've introduced you now to Luke, so you should be up to date, I think. But, but don't be surprised that it jumps right into what Luke's been up to running-wise. Yeah. All right, let's get into it with Luke. 20 miles this week, probably, so uh, I'm still able to train pretty hard. Uh, I'll be 38 in April, so... I'm um, trying to get one more trials qualifier, which means I'll be, uh, I think, just under 40 at the next trial. So that'd be that would be my fourth fourth Olympic trials in the marathon. So we'll see we'll see after that. But uh, no, still hanging in there. But yeah, like I've been I've I've been on the team since 2004, and still am technically on the, on the team. So. That's amazing. So, I mean, you have your, your own training, which, I, again, I, I respect. I, I'm also sort of still going at it. Maybe not at Olympic trials sort of level. I mean, I, I'm in mountain biking, so I guess I could be – maybe I could yeah. call myself very long-listed. But there I don't you know go. if that's true. But um, And I think it does add a perspective. And, you, and the Brooks Distance Project, is it? it's mostly working with, with high-end runners, or do you have like a, a master's program as well? It's well. We do actually have a, a couple masters in the program, but there's still, you know, Dot's still running, you know, two thirty four, two thirty five in the marathon. So she's still very, very competitive. Um, and then actually myself, you know, like I said, I'll be thirty eight here pretty soon. And one of my teammates, Mike Morgan, he and actually works for me on the coaching part. Uh, he'll be thirty nine in February. So we're still we have a few few people who are right on that edge of being in the masters, and a couple people who are are still in the masters, but yeah, it's all basically Olympic level or Olympic trials level, level athletes. So, um, you know, we're definitely the oldest on the team, but, uh, you know, like right now, I think we have a few, few guys that are, you know, 23, 24. Or so, um, we're definitely, you know, we definitely have the full end of the spectrum on the ages, but the the, the level of comp- competition is still the same for, for everybody. Um, where I come into play is, um, you know, so basically, you know, my story is 2006, uh, Kevin and Keith, Kevin and Keith have done clinics at the stores for forever. And, uh, I, I was finishing up my master's degree in exercise science and, uh, you know, their kids were getting to the age where they were doing a lot more stuff. And I think they want to just be more involved with their families and said, Hey Luke, why don't you just take over the clinics for us? And, you know, we'll give you all the information. You just start presenting the clinic. So that's really how it started for me. So I was doing clinics at the stores for, you know, people who wanted to run the Detroit marathon in October. And, uh, and so I would just start doing that. And then eventually a couple people said, Hey, can you coach me individually, this and that. And the next thing I knew, um, I was coaching individuals. So I, I started a LLC just, and I talked to Kevin and Keith and they said I could use Hanson's in the name. So it's just Hanson's coaching. And uh, so, you know, then, then, you know, that was over 12 years ago. So then it just has grown significantly since then. But uh, yeah, that's really, really how it started. So I'm working mostly with 
uh, with recreational runners, but I, you know, I'm working with, I mean, that's a full spectrum of people too, though. Like I'm coaching, you know, a 49 year old right now who's running 240 in the marathon. And I'm also coaching a guy who just wants to break five hours in the marathon. So, you know, I have a full spectrum and, you know, I've coached, I'm coaching people, a couple people on, you know, uh, not in the Olympic uh, project, but on the, you know, with that, I'm personally coaching that are, you know, trying to, trying to qualify for the Olympic trials as well. So it's definitely a, a full spectrum of people, but, you know, we coach, gosh, we coach 170 people at peak individually and, you know, 160 of them are just people trying to get what they can out of the marathon, you know? So, uh, you know, it, it just, uh, it's definitely a full, full range of people. Right. Right. And within that you're coaching all distances of people or, or how many, uh, like what, what, what would like you're down to 5k or you have a track program too, or what, what's the range on the distances? A little bit. I, I would say just where we've made our name is the marathon, though. And so the vast majority of people are running a marathon. So we definitely do coach the other distances. But what, what we end up seeing a lot of times is people come for us for a marathon segment and they stay long term. And so we'll coach them to get them faster at shorter distances and then come back to the marathon and things like that. So we do coach all distances, but I think most people come to us originally for the marathon. That'd be pretty safe to say. Right, right. Now, it, what would a run, you know, I'm curious, I have coaching business, so this is somewhat of a selfish question, but in your run clinics, like what, what type of form do those take? I mean, you're, people could even mm-hmm. come down. A lot of our listeners are, you know, I, I would say in that uh, East Coast sort of region, so you guys aren't far away. So what what's a, mm-hmm. what's a run clinic for a marathon look like? Is that, you know, one day, half a day, you know, a series of events, or what are we doing? So typically what we would do, I actually, we've kind of shot, we've actually grown so much from the online component that we've gotten away from the, the group stuff uh, from the community standpoint. And that's, that's honestly one of the things I'm trying to get back to in, in next year in 2019 is streamline some things online so I can go back to doing the community-based stuff, uh, which is where, you know, I, I just like building those relationships with, with you know, local people that, you know, want to run. And, uh, but when we first started, it was basically, it was basically a program for the Detroit marathon in October. So we'd start, uh, we'd start in mid June and it would just be a series of, so every Tuesday and Thursday we'd have group runs from one of the stores. Uh, Sundays we'd have group longer runs from, from one of our stores. We have a, we have a really great location for, for our Lake Orion store, which is a little further North of Rochester, but you can literally step out the door and hit dirt roads right away and so we try to do a lot of the longer stuff out there um but uh yeah so it'd be basically you'd have three options for group runs during the week and then uh we would do clinics like every other wednesday or something like that where we would just talk about different educational components so the actual coaching would be more at the group runs we'd do a clinic at one of the stores, you know, we'd get pizza and beer or whatever and, and, you know, and do a, an hour long talk about, you know, it might be, it might be, um, you know, structuring your training. It might be maximizing recovery, how, how to implement strength training, uh, might be just on basic physiology and learning why you're doing certain, certain workouts, um, nutrition stuff. And then we talk about taper, race day logistics, you know, we try to cover everything that we could. We'd basically have a whole section of stuff. And basically, basically what's in the book are things that we would cover from an educational standpoint at the clinics. And then we would just make sure we were available for group runs and things like that. And then the, the schedules that are in the book is, are, that's, those were, that's where those started. I mean, those, those schedules were the schedules that Kevin and Keith handed out, you know, 25 years ago. So um, it's all just kind of all packaged up now and in nice, a nice, uh, paperback form now, so right. uh, but which is handy, right? Like you say, as you get more and more people having that sort of handbook for people to hopefully go through and read, um, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, they can sort of even clients that are working with you, um, you know, they can sort of use that as a so they understand the philosophy, right? They understand, oh, I, it, absolutely, absolutely. And, and it's, it's actually kind of funny because you know, we get a lot of people individually coaching now and. And uh, we'll write them something custom. It's still it's still the philosophy, but it's more custom to what they need. 
And, uh, you know, they'll be like, well, this isn't in the book. <laughs> it's like, well, but you, you wanted something custom. So, you know, if you, you could save yourself a lot of time and money by just using the book. But, right. uh, you know, so but it, it is funny because a lot of people, they, they you know, it, it's interesting. I'll, I'll, I don't do a ton of signings and stuff like that. But, you know, we do go to a running store and somebody will bring a, a dog-eared copy of the book. And, you know, it's like all uh, indexed out and it's all, you know, kind of, you know, there's underlined thing. It's, I love it. Cause it, you know, and then people are actually using it, you know, so like when somebody, and they'll, they'll be like embarrassed because they got this kind of ripped up book. I'm like, no, that's great. I mean, you're using it. That's, that's perfect. That's what it's for, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you're probably referring to the Hanson's marathon method, which yeah, is the, the, the first one that came version. out. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and it, it's definitely, like, I've heard that mentioned before, and I think it's, for a lot of people, like you say, it's almost become, you know, similar to, you know, there's a Joe Friel's training Bible for cyclists, and he has a series of those books for mountain mm-hmm. bikers and stuff, and, um, you know, I think for a lot of people, it's, you know, these are, this is sort of the system, right, and, um, you know, it, it works for a lot of people. Just It does. Like, you know, there's that, you have to have a plan of some type, right, some sort of progression. Ex- sort of exactly, type. and in all honesty, is a lot of times just, just having a plan that you believe in is going to allow you to, it's really going to increase your chances to be successful. You know, it's when, you know, a lot of times people don't like a plan. They don't, you know, they've got it in their head already that it's not going to work. You no, know, chances are it's probably not going to work just because of that mindset going into it. But yeah, I mean, I find, I find people either absolutely love the system or they just, they just look at it from afar and say, nope, that's not for me. And which is fine. I mean, I, you can't be naive enough to think that you're going to be able to fit something for every single person. And you shouldn't have to. I mean, you either, if you have something that you believe in, that's all you need, right? Some people are going to believe in it. Some people aren't going to believe in it. But, you know, I, you know, we have a Facebook group with, you know, 10,000 people in it. And, you know, most of those people have had great success with, with the plan. So, um, but that's not to say people have had great success with Hal Higdon or Jeff Galloway or right. any of those people, you know, so it, it really just depends on the, on the person. Yeah, for sure it does. Right. And, and there's that intricacy, you know, where people can't train on certain days or, you know, they, they do end up with an injury or, or coming in with an injury or, you know, there's, there's mm-hmm. all sorts of different, you know, snowflake type situations, but, um, right. Absolutely. But yeah. Like you say, it, it's often sort of some variation on that, that system. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is funny. Have you, you, you did sort of mention that, but do you find that people, you know, think of you as this certain type of coach, you know, a, a tempo coach or a, you know, this, long slow distance versus high intensity and then when you go to use high intensity say if you were a long slow distance quote-unquote coach you know it's hard that's it's funny how people sort of like pigeonhole you and you're like well no they're all sort of tools right right oh yeah absolutely and you know we're at we're mostly known oh you're the 16 mile long run people you know like i can't just do six you know everybody else says to do 20 miles but it's like well and they get stuck and they get stuck on that and that's when i was referring back when people just look at it from afar and they don't ever look at why it's 16 miles. Like what leads up to you doing that 16 miler at the end of the week? Like what, what, what were you doing the previous six days? What were you doing the previous uh, 14 days? You know, and that's really where the 16 mile comes from. And, but people get stuck on, Oh, you're just doing 16 mile long runs. Like, okay. Yeah. But I would guarantee you that you're doing more mileage than most, most, you know, runner's world programs or whatever you're looking at, I can guarantee you. Because honestly, I ran into that problem when we wrote the first book is Vel- uh, VeloPress came in and said, like, hey, we we want to call this less is more. And I'm like, well, did you actually look at the schedule? Because you're running 60 <laughs> miles a week. <laughs> and it's not like you're doing 30 miles a week and you're only, you know, but that's where I think people get stuck. They, they focus on one aspect of what you're doing. And in reality, that one aspect is determined by, all of the other things that you're doing. And that's where it's really important to look at the, the whole entire body of what you're actually getting in during the week and during, you know, the entire segment. Okay. I mean, that's, I, it begs the question then now I, I need to sort of know like why, why 16 miles? Like, does that sort of correspond with a certain duration that where the sort of risk reward is, is, is lower or higher? Um, you know, is that where you ended up with 16 or is there, is there a story behind the 16? I guess is what I'm wondering. 
Well, you know, you talk to me, it's a different story than what if you talk to, to Kevin and Keith about, about right. it. But, sure. you know, Kevin, Kevin's a great storyteller. And so he, he'd always, when I was listening to when he did the clinics, um, I would just kind of pick up on what he was saying. But basically, Kevin's version of it was, you know, the, himself and, and Keith were putting the schedules together. So this would have been in the probably the early 90s that they were putting these schedules together. And so Kevin's just flipping through all these books and he had these runner world runners world UK versions of, of runners world. And, you know, he's looking at the schedules and they're like, well, they just peak out at 30 K 30 K isn't 20 miles. So why are we doing 20 miles? And it just comes out, you know, his version of it would be basically like 20 miles is a nice round version of, of a long run. Right. So if you get to 20 miles, you know, that's where you need to be. Um, and it worked out well because, you know, people hit the wall, they bonk it between, you know, anywhere from 18 to 22 miles. So if you just make it a nice round 20 miles, it's like, good. Oh, if you can do a 20 miler, you can be fine in the marathon. And that's kind of where it seemingly evolved, um, here in the United States. But, you know, you look overseas and all these other, uh, metric, uh, calendars, it's like, well, they would, a lot of those schedules would only go to 30 K because it's the same thing. It was a, it was a nice round number that was a long run that worked. And, you know, so, um, you know, that's it. And so where I came into it, it's like, I believe, I totally, I obviously believe what Kevin's saying, but where I, where I come in on it is I, you know, you look at things where, um, you know, just a lot of, a lot of like, um, free, uh, schedules, you can get from runner's world or wherever, um, you would only do, you might peak out at 40 miles a week. And if you're doing a 20 mile long run, you're putting most of your emphasis on that single run, right? So if you if you're doing 40 miles and 20 of it's coming from one run, that only leaves you 20 miles for the rest of the week. So what are you doing the rest of the six weeks? Well, you don't have a lot of room to play with, right? So uh, you're probably not doing a lot. And so what ends up happening is you recover for that 20 miler, and then you recover after that 20 miler, and now you're left with only a few days of training. So you're really not. To me, you're really not necessarily you're not trained, you're not training, you're surviving from long run to long run because every, it takes up so much volume of what you're doing. And, it, and for most people, if you take a four hour marathon or a 20 mile long run, it's going to take them well over three hours, which does become an issue because then once you get over three hours, three and a half hours in that type of range, then you're really talking about, you've dug a hole so deep from, you can talk about glycogen depletion, muscle damage, this and that, but you've, you've created such a hole that you've dug yourself into on that one run that now you have to get back out of that hole. And so the only way to do that is to take one, two, three days where you're not really doing anything. And so then you're really limited on what you can do for training. So to me, it comes down to if you're doing those mega long runs where they're 50, 60 percent of your long, of your weekly volume, you're not training. You're, you're simply surviving to cover the distance. So will you be able to do it? Absolutely. You'll be able to run a marathon doing it that way. But from my experience and, and really from people we've coached over the years, what they found is that we survived that first marathon, right? We survived it because we were able to survive the 20 milers, but they come to us and they're like, yeah, your training is hard and we hate you for 18 weeks, but then we feel so much better because we were able to do all this other balanced training and not just put all of our emphasis on the long run. And so that's really, I mean, that's really where it comes down to is if we scale back a little bit on the long run, increase the overall mileage a little bit, we can get so much more work done during the week so that by the time you get to that 16 miler, you're not fresh. You're, you're already tired going into that 16 miler. So it's, Kevin and Keith always say like that 16 miler isn't like doing the first 16 miles of a marathon. It's like doing the last 16 miles of a marathon because you're already fatigued going into it. And so that's where, that's where we get in. That's where, that's where we kind of separate ourselves from, from other people. Yeah. That frequency piece often gets missed. Right. And that's, that's ultimately what you're talking about is how mm -hmm. often can you train, right. And mm -hmm. even how often can you train with quality and Exactly. I think you see that in a lot of sports, whether it's strength training or cycling's bad for it too. You know, everyone wants to do their five, six hour ride on the weekend. And it's like, I mean, 90 minute rides are, are pretty valuable in my mind. That's sort of my critical number is 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, maybe on the weekend we're hitting like a three hour ride, but you know, that's even for the elites. And then you'll see, you know, the weekend warriors are trying to smash like a six hour ride on the weekend. And it's like, I couldn't even imagine how tired you would be. Right. Um, 
so it's similar. And, and I mean, you would have the same thing. Like there's, there are people, you know, the, the very elite of the elite maybe can like absorb that. And there's the piece that their 16 mile run or 20 mile run isn't a three hour run. Right. Correct. Oh, absolutely. Right. And, and that's where you definitely have to, you know, we, we, you know, I, we put this, we put this in both books, the, the Hans's marathon method and the, the first marathon method. So, um, so honestly, the, the first marathon method will include basically everything from the previous books, but then also specific things for first time marathoners. But going back to the point was, um, was, uh, yeah, I think, uh, that's uh that's exactly it you know you just keep that you keep that balance and you keep that frequency of, of training and you learn how to train and then as a person who advances like so i have people who started off with just the book and then their mileage really hasn't changed but since they've done this the, the say the advanced plan for three four times in a row we can change some other variables on them because they've gotten faster and so that we can shake that, we can shake that up a little bit for them and we can individualize that for them a little bit, but the same philosophy will always stay true. But yeah, if you're running, you know, take for instance, you know, if we're doing a 20, 20 miler, we're also, we're doing a hundred miles a week. So in essence, our long runs only 20% of what our week is. Whereas for the, say the advanced plan, it might be, you know, 25 to 30% of the, of the, of the weekly volume. So, you know, those percentages might change a little bit as you get faster and your mileage increases, but um, we can still get a lot, a lot of stuff done. Awesome. Yeah. So this newest book is called your first, the first marathon method. So why don't we dive into that? Like what, uh, who is this for? I mean, obviously someone who hasn't gone done a marathon, but um, you know, how does someone know they're, they're ready to do their first marathon? That's a good, you know, that's, that's a good question. I think, uh, that your, their, your first, your second part there, um, how do they know, I, I, you know, that that's where we're at. We're at a really weird, not really weird, but it's just a, a place in, in our marathoning history, I guess, where you're having so many, so many people involved in the sport with no, running background in particular. And I touch on stats a lot in the book where, you know, you look back at the seventies, early seventies, runningusa.org has kept stats on this for decades, but you basically have, um, 20,000 people, mostly men running a marathon and the average time was under three hours. And so you had a very select group of young men running fast and now you look at it, you know, in 2018, and you're looking at, on average for the last five years or so, 550 to 600,000 people just in the United States have run a marathon. And, you know, the times have obviously decreased. And some of that's just because we're slower. Some of that's because uh, the average age is, has has grown. You know, it was, I think it was right around 30 in 1970. But now I think the average age is you know, late thirties, maybe early forties, um, you know, 50% of the, I think it's actually more women are participating than men now. I think it's like slightly more men than women. I think it's like 55, 45. Um, but the average male time is like three forty-five. I think the average woman's time is right around four hours. Um, so you're, you're, you've got more and more people involved in the sport, but more and more people who maybe didn't run in high school, maybe didn't run in college. Maybe didn't, they're just now in their mid thirties and want to take up running. And so this, you know, everybody says you got to run a marathon, you know, if you want to be, you know, you want to be in that select pool where you got to run a marathon. And I think two where things have changed is, uh, um, just with the charity stuff, like so many people just want to run to raise money for charity, which is great. But a lot of times those people are just starting from scratch. Right. So, so to answer that question, it's tough. Like, I think anybody can, as long as they're healthy, it's more of a matter of, um, don't decide eight weeks before the marathon that you want to run a marathon. I think if you've never run, you've got to give yourself plenty of time to build up. Um, but I think this, this book is really for all those people. It's for the person who has never run before and wants to start from scratch. We have, we have something for you. We, if the person who has done their local 5k and 10k, and, you know, this is a bucket list thing that they want to do is, is run a marathon. We've got a plan for you. We've got a plan for the person who, uh, you know, has rate, you know, is 
age group ace in the five and 10 K maybe run a half or something like that once in a while, but are really more competitive in the five and 10 K we've got a plan for you. Um, you know, there, there's, there's really, a, it's really anybody who's attempting to run their first marathon. We've got something for you. And honestly too, I think people, people who've looked at our book, Hans's marathon method, they're always, they're pretty intimidated when they look at those schedules It's six days a week of running, you're getting up to 50, 60 miles a week, even in the beginner plans. And I think most people who look at our beginner or advanced would say your beginner is more like a intermediate at least plan. And so a lot of people just get turned off right away from doing the plans because they look at it and they said, no way, there's no way I can dedicate this amount of time, this, this amount of effort into running the marathon. So and I said, I looked at it. I said, okay, I'll give you that. And and so I said, six days a week for, you know, and just knowing and doing this for, for 12 years now and seeing the people who are running the marathons that are using our plans, I can still get that person, you know, say say the mom who's, you know, staying at home with her four kids and, and running on the treadmill or the business person who's traveling five days a week or whatever the case is. I get, I get that it's really hard to fit those six days a week in. So... I took it and I said, okay, how can we back this off just a little bit, introduce them into learning how to train for a marathon, and then move on from there, right? So maybe the next time they go around, then they jump up to the Hanson's Marathon Method. So in essence, even if you've run a marathon and you're like, man, that's six, I'm really intimidated by that schedule, the original schedules, I could jump into one of these. These seem much more uh, sensible for, for me, where I'm at and what I can do. And so that, so even if you've run a marathon, we probably have a plan that's in there. You know, it's five days a week. Um, you know, it's going to get up to about 40 to 50 miles a week, which I think for a marathon is where you need to be. If you look at it from that standpoint, at 50 miles a week, you're still not even twice the race distance that you're going to run, right? So you're spreading that out over seven days. Um, whereas you look at, you know, an argument I make too, and this is a, this is an old, uh, um, uh, Dr. Martin quote was like, he was basically say, well, if you're running 20 miles a week and you're racing a 5k, uh, you're still running seven times more than your race distance over the week. You know, so you're, you're getting a lot of volume compared to what you're actually racing. Whereas the marathon, if you're running 30 miles a week, you're barely getting one times your race distance for the entire week that you're going to run on one day. Uh, so I, so I, I do think there's a certain amount of volume you have to have in order to to be somewhat successful, make it attainable to actually be not necessarily comfortable is probably the wrong word, but to be sustainable for for the marathon. Right, right, and and I wonder too, is there? You guys also have a, a half marathon method book for anyone who's, you know, maybe the distance is going to be an issue. But is there someone, you know, if, if these early early runners who are still struggling to get, you know. The, the volume up to you know mm-hmm. finishing a 5k you know there's obviously like years would you say years of progress there just even from like a soft tissue neuromuscular adaptation standpoint right like you hate to turn anyone away but there's some people just like the best idea here is going to be to look at this over a course of years yeah i i, I maybe i think in terms of adaptation yeah absolutely you can you're going to adapt for a long time um, and then over time, where you adapt is going to, to change as well. Um, but I think, you know, I'm just thinking back. The, probably the most popular training plan out there for true beginning marathoners is, is probably Jeff Galloway. You know, the run, walk, start at scratch, and then, you know, you know, 78 weeks. You know, I'm just kidding. But it seems for his schedule seems like it's forever. Like, it seems like it's like a 40-week schedule. But he literally will take you from zero to a marathon in about a year. And I think is I think that's attainable. I, I, I think that, you know, you, where I see most people run into problems is so the cardiovascular system will adapt really quick, right? You'll you if you're consistently getting out there three or four times a week, you're running 30 minutes at a time, you're gonna see improvement right away. But the where the problem usually occurs is that bone, tendon, and ligament are way behind on that, you know, so your, your, your heart's going to be more fit than your, than your tibia. Right. And so what happens is people feel really good. They start increasing the pace or they start increasing the amount of time, or they start increasing the number of days they're running, or they do all three at once, which is probably more likely they just start doing all three more at the same time. 
and they never allow the musk or the the structural system to come along with the cardiovascular system and then they get the shin splints they you know they get the stress fractures they get the you know the plantar fasciitis they get the achilles tendonitis all those things those will those will flare up pretty quick because they weren't given enough time to adapt so i agree i, I think there's a, i think there's somewhere in the middle where you know it's not i don't think it's going to take you something like two or three years to build up to to be able to run a marathon um but i think that you can't just rush into it i think you know ideally you know if i could get if somebody's not running at all i would say six months is probably your bare minimum but ideally what i would like to do if i were coaching you is i'd like to like you said i'd like to get you to where you can run 30 minutes at a time and then let's talk about a 5k and then let's talk about a 10k and then let's talk about a half marathon and then let's talk about a full marathon right um but in reality, people are going to want to run a marathon in six months. So I think you can. I think you have to be very careful with it. Um, is it the best? Mm, probably not. Yeah, I would maybe say a year or so would be better. But um, that's not really the world we live, the world we live right. in right now. So, <laughs> so I try to always blend with what we should do with what is probably going to happen. <laughs> Right, and that's that's certainly the reality, right, is trying to help people, you know, do the best and understand, you know, there's a lot of athleticism and, you know, pride to be taken in a well-run 5K, right? You, know, mm-hmm. you, you can hurt really badly over 400 meters or, uh, you know, even 100 meters would be perhaps the, you know, not many people are great at running for 100. Um, you know, but the, like, as you say, someone's always going to ask you if you've ever run a marathon or in, you know, in triathlon, have you ever done an Ironman, right? Mm-hmm. But right. If, you, if right. you watch it, you know, an Olympic distance or sprint triathlon, it's tremendously athletic and exciting. And you know, oh, absolutely. Most, most people cannot coordinate that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and all the elements of the sport are there, right? You know, once you're, and it's odd because that's also the progression that uh, I'm trying to think like Alexi Pappas, I think just sort of made her yeah chicago debut after yep. being a short distance right and that tends yep. to be how the elites do it right is they, they tend to do come short and if you if you look at a lot of their debuts they don't go well at all right. they don't they because 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 in reality so like you know uh let me use uh uh let me use bernard Bagat as an example so he's i don't know he's 42 or 43 and he's gonna he's making his marathon debut this weekend at, in new york and so you see a guy like that who was at one time one of the fastest 1,500 people in the world, um, you know, like second second fastest in the world. Um, and so he can literally run a 345 mile. So he looks at it and he's like, okay, well, you want me to run five minute pace for, oh, that's going to be a jog, you know? And I, I don't think they understand, like, you have to extrapolate that out to 26 miles and you, and just like things like simple things like fueling that you don't have to think about in a 5k, a mile, a 10k, you don't have to think about those things. But for the marathon, if you don't think about those things, it's going to make or break your race, right? Like you, you might feel great. And all of a sudden you're going to, you're going to just hit that wall. You're going to wonder what the heck happened. You're going to be like, it's going to be a whole, I mean, and the thing is, it's a whole different pain and discomfort than, going out too hard in a 5k, right? It's not that lung burning, you know, you know, quote, air quote, lactic acid burn that you feel in a 5k. It's the, oh my God, this isn't right. Like this, <laughs> something's not right. I, I physically cannot go, you know, and, and I don't think people know if you've never felt that it can be incredibly scary. Right. And so I think, and it's just like, a whole new shock to the system like you know you see it i mean an iron man an iron man is a perfect ex- i mean that is the true like how you manage your fueling is going to dictate how you manage your race for a lot of that right so if you don't you know if you don't do that right you know it's it's going to you could have the you could have the fastest bike in the world but if you don't have the engine to power it it's not going to matter right and so i don't think those things are thought about a lot of times when those those uh, shorter distance elite athletes, I think they get a little cocky on it and they <laughs> think right. that they're going to go out and, you know, run 209 their first marathon and say, yeah, I've seen right. a lot of people think that and not do it. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I don't know if running, you know, has this quite the same. Like, we have power curves, basically, in cycling. So, like, your sprinter would have a very steep curve. Um, so at the short end of the curve, they'd have very high power or sorry, at the left side of the curve, they'd have a very high power output for like 10 seconds, say right. or tw- 20 seconds. But if you go- take that curve out to three hours, it drops off very quickly. Mm-hmm. Whereas your time trialist or your triathlon athlete would be a, the most f- classic. They'd have a very flat curve. So like no sprint, but then they hold, you know, they a can high go percent. forever. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if running, I guess running, you could chart the exact same pace thing over duration, right? Oh, for sure. For sure. And I think, uh, yeah, it, but what, yeah, I think what you'd see in a lot of times is, is, is especially if you take a more, uh, shorter race person who's more experienced with five K's and 10 K's or just better at that, what you'll see is. Yeah, they'll start out very fast, and they can hold that for a little while. But then when it goes bad, it's going to go bad and really quick, and it's going to get really bad. And, you know, there's not like a it, it, there's not like a gradual drop off. It's like when it goes, it just goes. And you know, you could be running. Say you say you take a you know you take an elite woman marathoner who's running five, say five forty five a mile, go go go, and then all of a sudden it's like six thirties. Then it's like 730s. I mean, it's just, it gets really bad really quick, you know, and there's like, so that's when people say, oh, I'm going to put time in the bank in the first half. It's like, okay, that's fine that you have, you have 30 seconds, you're 30 seconds ahead of schedule, but when you get to 22 and you're losing three minutes a mile, how's that time in the bank working for you? And I don't, and it's a hard relation. And if you've never, and again, it's never seen it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You almost have to experience once to really kind of grasp the concept, like, okay, Yes, I do have, even at 30 seconds, it seems minute, but it can, you're riding that fine line of being able to maintain a pace or not maintain a pace. And so you always want to be just on the the conservative side of maintaining that pace and then not falling off at the end. Because when, you know, if you're a little bit ahead of that pace, it's just enough where when it goes, it just goes. And, And there's, there's, and the thing is, there's no coming back from that. Once it's gone, it doesn't matter what you do. It's, it's our, it's going to be gone. Yeah, yeah. So switching gears a bit then, I, I want to, you guys have a great way, I think, of breaking out sort of your, I guess it's in some ways your the philosophy, but the classification of workouts, um, I thought it was fairly eloquent. There's an, a couple nice graphics in the book, um, but it's the one I'm talking about here is you sort of have your total weekly volume, and that's made up of easy mileage and what you guys call SOS workouts. Yep. Um, so I wonder if you could just even just briefly run us through sort of like when people are looking at, we've talked a lot here about training and a little, you know, we, we got down some rabbit holes, uh, but yeah. all, really, all really good. And I think talks about what a marathon is, but maybe when people are thinking, okay, there's, this is this other level of intensity. Maybe we've talked about right. frequency and we've talked about weekly volume or daily volume. So then what, what's, how is that made up? You, you have your easy mileage and your SOS workouts. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's easy. Easy and SOS, which so easy is self-explanatory. It's just easy paced running, conversational paced running. Um, I will say this is where a lot of people, and this is experienced marathoners as well, um, make their biggest mistakes, that they want to run these too hard. Um, Easy running is really about, especially for your first marathon, it's really about just putting time time on your feet, right? And it's not – we always give a range with easy runs. And so obviously we have a lot of competitive people and they think that if they're at the fast end of that easy range all the time, that's going to be better. Um, But the truth is anywhere in that range is fine. So if you're feeling like crap one day, slow those easy easy paces down. If you feel good, that's fine. Run a little bit faster on the easy day. Just stay within the range. So you have a little bit of freedom on there. But I always tell people you got to you got to listen to your body on these and you can't run your easy runs too fast all the time, especially early in a training segment, just because that will catch up to you later in the training segment. But that's easy runs. That's usually, that's like, you know, roughly one and a half to three minutes slower than your marathon pace uh, per mile. Uh, And then you have the SOS, which is made up of um, speed, which there's some differences there, strength, and then uh, tempo. And so speed, I always prefer to use 10K pace 
this could be current or this could be, or if you've never run a 10 K, you know, you plug your time, you plug your goal race time into a calculator. And we actually have a calculator on our site, Hanson's coaching services.com. You can just plug in your goal time. It'll give you all the paces that you need to be hitting. Um, but either way, I usually like to use 10 K pace. Um, one, we're not trying to necessarily get faster at the 5k or 10k right now. It's really just more about balance and getting some faster work in. And it's really kind of preparing you to learn how to do intervals if you've never done them before or repeats before, if you've never done them before. Um, and so it's just kind of, it's kind of more of teaching you how to do a, a repeat type of workout. Um, and, and it's getting you faster relative to the distance you're running. So 10k is significantly faster than the marathon. So it's relative to that standpoint. And that will be three miles worth of work. So a lot of times it's 12 by 400 meters or eight by 600 meters, six by 800, all the way up to three times a mile. Um, and that will be the first part of the, sec of the, of the marathon, of the marathon training plan. And then you move on later in the, later in the weeks, we, mo we shift more to more marathon specific work. And that's when you go from speed to strength workouts, which is, you know, a lot of people will try to equate this with half marathon. So more like lactate threshold type of stuff. In reality, it's slower than that. It's just, it's 10 seconds per mile faster than marathon pace. So you see that on paper and you're like, that's not that fast, right? So what, um, and that's another mistake people do. They'll try, they'll cheat that down more closer to half marathon pace. So, which might be 20 seconds per mile faster than marathon pace or 30 seconds, whatever the case is. Uh, but this is six miles worth of work. So it's six by one, four times a mile and a half, uh, three times two, two times three. I do a three, two, one, but it's six miles worth of work at that faster pace. Um, and that's, that's really like the last six, eight weeks of, of the marathon segment. That's more marathon specific is, is dealing a little bit with accumulating lactic acid, but it's more about running a significant amount of time at a faster pace. And then the last section is tempo runs, which is uh, marathon pace. Our tempos are always marathon pace and those will go, you know, they'll start at like four miles and build to 10 miles in the, in the first marathon uh, we do, I break those up sometimes. I'll do like, I'll do like a, maybe like a two times four miles or something like that, where I'll break it up a little bit, but those are always at marathon pace. And that's kind of one of our other things is we do a lot of work at marathon pace throughout the entire training plan, because we want you to learn from day one, basically how that, how that pace feels and how that pace feels over dis, you know, if you're training in the summer, how does that pace feel in the heat? If you're training in the winter, how does that pace feel in the, in the cold? You know, this and that. So, but those are the, those are the three main SOS and then kind of a bridge type of thing would be the long run. You know, the long run for the first marathoner, first, first time marathoners is probably just going to be at their easy run pace, right? Cause I'm just more worried about building their general endurance. Uh, but the fact is you're going to probably be out there for two to three hours so it makes it much more difficult than a regular easy run. So um, the long run's kind of in the gray, the gray zone there. But those are the those are the five components of the of the marathon plan, and that's that's pretty simple. That's awesome, and it's getting more specific, sort of as the uh, event approaches. So you're starting yep. to, you know, obviously approach that distance and more time at at that intended pace. Yeah. Um, and I think that that time at intended pace makes a lot of sense, right? And we were just talking about, you know, people falling apart because they weren't, you know, used to pacing or fueling or running, exactly. that, running that long at that quote unquote fast or specific pace, right? So mm -hmm. it seems like that's, you know, when people think about goal setting or pacing for an event, um, you know, when those questions arise, it's often, you know, they've skipped that portion of the book or the training plan they're following, right? They, they haven't, you know, really paid attention in those that build up the training, which should prepare them for race day. Right. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. So along with that, like the, the specificity of training, the increased specificity of training, is there other concepts as far as setting goals for race day for these uh, more beginner marathoners, the first time marathoners? Yeah, and we talk. You know, it's it's for the first time marathoners. You really don't have 
kind of a, a benchmark, right? So, you know, if you're taking somebody who has already run a marathon and they run 430, well, we can set a goal of 415, you know, something like that. Um, but uh, for the first timers, it's, it's, it is a little bit tougher. So we'll actually have a series of questions to, add, to ask people in the book, you know, and I, the purpose, a lot of the purpose of that is to force them to take a look at themselves and say like, okay, here's my strengths, here's my weaknesses. And then what you can do is you can take like, say you've run a 5k, you can run, a, you can take your 5k, plug it into a calculator, a race equivalency calculator. And it's, you know, let's say it says you can, you're capable of running four hours. Okay. So then we book, then we know what your strengths and weaknesses are. And if we know that you're probably going to be better at shorter distances, we can say, well, four hours is really kind of like the best of the best. So let's take a step back from there a little bit. And so a little bit of it's kind of trial and error. Um, you might set some, so like using that four hour example, we might say, okay, well, let's, let's train for like 410 and just see what happens. Cause we want to, we want this to be a positive experience for them. And so we say, when I say 410 and then we get into workouts and then since they're doing tempos from day one or pretty much day one, or they're doing a lot of marathon pace stuff, we're going to know pretty quick how aggressive that is. And so our, our goal is to always say a final time goal by the time you do, by the time you start the strength workouts, because by then, then you're in the last six to eight weeks of a plan for the most part. And that's going to be the most race specific. So that's by, that's the absolute latest you want to be completely dialed into, into a time. So, so I'll admit, I mean, the first, the first four to six weeks might be a little bit of trial and error. Um, you doing, you know, just doing the paces that you kind of originally start. Um, and then, and then going from there. I will say, you know, and that's where, that's the beauty of working with a coach, right? And you probably know this too, right? So that if you're working with somebody, you can look at their log, right? And you can, and you can ask them follow-up questions. So they might say, oh, the tempo went fine. Okay. What does fine mean? You know, did, did it, were you able to, if you would have had to have gone, you know, 20 more minutes at that pace, could you have, uh, or were you completely spent by the end of that? You know, what was the intensity level of that? You know, there's, there's a lot of things you can ask yourself to say, okay, was it truly what it should have been? Or was I just basically selling my soul to hit this workout? You know, if somebody's selling their soul to hit a workout, then that might be a little bit aggressive, you know, especially for a, for a marathon pace workout. If if you're talking about a a speed workout, that's fine because that's not, that's not what we're training for. Right. So if that's a hard workout, that's going to be a hard workout. Um, it's no big deal, but the tempo run, like you should never feel, you should never feel like, oh my God, that was it. Right. That was, there's no way I could go any further. You should, I don't think, I don't think you should get to the end of a 10 mile tempo run and say, man, I could go 16 more miles at that pace, but I should be able to say I could go two or three more miles at that pace. No problem. I could do that. You know, it's because you're in the heart of your training you're in the biggest mileage, the biggest volume, the most intensity, you know, the hardest work's being done, the longest long runs are being run. You're tired, right? And that's the whole point of the plan. We're trying to make you tired, but we're trying to get, not make you so tired that you get hurt. And so if you're overdoing it on all your workouts, then it might be time to say, okay, this, this goal is probably a little aggressive. We can back off. On the other hand, if you're like, man, this is nothing, maybe you do, you do bump it up. But, um, for me, I'm always more conservative on that stuff because I always, so if somebody comes to me with a four hour goal and then four weeks later, they're like, well, you know, workouts are going really well. Let's try for 345. It's like, well, but here's the deal. If we go to 345 and now it's too much, are you going to be so overtrained that you don't even run the four hour goal, which was the original goal? So you always have to be, you, you know, you always have to be, you always have to be careful on that. Um, so like a lot of times with that, I might, I might just split the difference and say, let's train for like 353 to 355, which still sets them up to run well. And if, if it even falls apart a little bit, they can still run under four hours. But if the training's still pretty good, they're going to set themselves up to run under 350 by being a little undertrained than being overcooked. You know, that's always the goal. You don't want to go into a race. If you go into a race overcooked, you're done from the start. But if you go in a little bit underdone, you still actually have a chance to run faster than what you originally thought you could run because you're a little bit more fresh, but you've still done the volume and the intensity that you, that you were assigned to. Right. So, um, but yeah, I, I've never seen anybody be so exhausted in training and then have a really good, a good race. Like they're tired, but they're not like, you know, dragging, dragging themselves out of bed every morning just to get to work or whatever the case is, you know, so there's, there's a fine line you have to, you have to work on there. 
That's perfect, yeah. Um, and this can be a, a quick answer here on the next one, but is there strength training as part of this first marathon, or do you feel like you know the running itself is going to take care of a lot of that and we only have so much time, or where are you at with strength training for early marathoners? Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's it's chicken and egg type of thing. Like I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in the strength training, but on the other hand, I, I know that if I can just get a person to run 40 miles a week, they're going to do pretty well. So I talk about it. I definitely talk about it, but I kind of leave it up to the person. Like if they're already overwhelmed with the training, I don't want to throw that on top of it and make it even more complicated for them. I want, you know, I very, I, I believe very much so in the fact you just keep things simple because the more complicated you make them, the less likely a person's going to adhere to it, right? Their, their longevity and it's not going to be, um, as, as, as good. So I, I kind of leave that up to the individual. I definitely talk about it and I think it's an important concept, but for it, I guess it would depend on the person too. If somebody's really just looking to say, Hey, all I really want to do is run five hours, raise money for, you know, the American cancer society or whatever they're doing. And I literally have no intention of ever doing this again. I'm not going to, I'm not going to hound that person to do a strength training program, you know, whatever. I, I, I get it. Um, but if somebody's looking to stay in the sport, to me, learning those things is is integral in, integral into um, developing a plan and learning how to train overall and take that with you, you know, years down the road. Yes, for sure. Now, obviously, running has you know components of strength. We can say you know there's some impact, some jumping. Mm-hmm. Um, do you use terrain at all as part of that? Um, you know, like an uphill, I guess, or, or off-road. You did talk about grass, sort of soccer field type stuff. Uh, is there a component we could call strength training even or, or resistance uh, as part of the actual running in, in your philosophy, especially for this first-time marathoner? I think so because a lot of, you know, one thing we try to push on, especially with your tempo runs, is if you're going to run a hilly course, then you should probably try to do your tempos on a hilly run, right? So... We do try to break it up. And even I'll go as far as saying with the speed, I don't even like a lot of my athletes doing their workouts on the track, their speed workouts on the track. I say, you know, go out and do them on the, on the, your regular your regular routes where you have some variation in terrain. Because, um, our, again, our goal isn't necessarily to get fast. It's, it's just getting fast relative to the distance of the marathon. And so, yeah, it, there definitely is. There's definitely a lot of a lot of different things you can do. And then, and then if you really wanted to, you could throw in things like strides or and, you know do those fast twitch types of things to make kind of make up for some of those components. But I think um, a lot of times, going back to it, you're already asking a person to run more than they've ever run in their life. Do we add this to it? In the, you know, I don't know if I know the answer to that because obviously, if they're stronger, they're going to be able to handle the mileage more. But if they are already running more mileage. Do they have time to do the strength? And then where do, where do you start? Where do you where do you end? You know what? How do you blend it all together? Um, and so a lot of times that just really depends on the individual. Right. Yeah. And so often it, you know <coughs> some people it might be you know a specific warm up drill, mm-hmm. um, you know some sort of mobility thing. You know if you know there's an underlying injury, um, you know lower leg. If someone's already gotten into having you know, some plantar fasciitis, you know, you might be, there might be some homework to do. Right. We, we could put under that or in that bucket of strength training, but might not be barbell squats in the gym necessarily. Oh, ab- absolutely. Like I, there's a, I don't know if you've ever, if I've read it, but it's uh, you can run pain free by uh, Brad beer. He's right. a, he's a physio guy out of New Zealand. Great routine. It's like 10 to 15 minutes long. People, people want to get started. That's a, that's a beautiful thing to start with. I mean, it's super simple. I mean, he's got a YouTube video. Just look it up on YouTube. You can follow right along. I mean, it's, and that'll do wonders for most people. You know, you don't have to go to a gym or do it. You know, you just take 10 minutes, 15 minutes. You know, you start out with doing that twice a week. That's a great foundation thing to start with. And then you can build on top of that if you, if you so decide. But, you know, I mean, a lot of that stuff I I do, it's just basic stuff that we kind of neglect and it's going to make you more resilient um, but it's not going to, it's not going to make or break you. And you know, it's something you literally, I'll literally stand on my stairs at our, in our living, by our living room and watch TV while I'm doing this. So, and, and do the routine, you know, so you can definitely, definitely do some simple things that will make you, uh, much stronger overall. 
Okay, perfect. Um, and then I think my last question then that I had here, I don't want to keep you too long, we're getting close to the hour, uh, was just, you know, when someone's in those last week or two, um, you know, again, we're not peaking for the Olympics, the, you know, the volume is not so high, so is there anything specific, uh, you know, in those last week or two to get ready for that big event? Like, what are what are the big rocks for, for being ready for first marathon? I think uh, a lot of people will read online, like, how much you have to cut out of your last couple of weeks. And people look at our program like, oh my gosh, you don't even have a taper. Uh, but they, they're looking at it from one aspect where we're just looking at the mileage. Um, you know, we're big believers in, in being pretty consistent. So if you're running five days a week, we're probably still going to run five days a week. We'll scale those mileage that mileage back um, and we'll scale the intensity back a little bit. But you really want to stay pretty consistent and it's just like when you start running, right? You don't want to build too fast too soon. It's the same thing with taper. You don't want to cut too much too soon. And I think when people cut all those components out of their program, um, where they really that's when they really start feeling sluggish. They start getting this, they start getting the sickness. Um, you know, Kevin's got a great line. He's like, if you're used to getting six hours of sleep a night and then all of a sudden you're getting 12 hours of sleep a night, do you feel good? Most of the time you don't. You feel pretty sluggish, right? That, that next day you feel sluggish because you're not used to getting that much sleep. And it's kind of the same thing with the taper. If you just cut everything back so much and you are resting so much that you, you really kind of feel sluggish and you really feel worse than if you would just keep that consistency a little bit. So that's a big thing. And then the other thing too, is I think you have to be really careful with nutrition. Cause what I see a lot of times is, you know, if you're running the most mileage you've ever run, you're probably eating the most calories you've ever run. And then all of a sudden you scale that back by you know, 25% and then 50% the next week, and you're still eating like you were running, you know, 40, 50 miles a week, and now you're running 30 miles a week, you got to be careful because you could put on quite a few pounds pretty quick with that, with, with doing that. Um, and so you really want to keep, you know, kind of that, that rate, you know, that air quotes race weight, uh, that you're at. Um, so you have to be careful with that. And we talk about that in the book too, where I, you know, I scale back on, um, eating to the day, eating, eating to what you've done for the day. Um, and then, and then going into your carbo load the last, the last few days, but, um, you can, you could do that. Like the last couple of days, if you put a couple pounds on, it's no big deal because it's, it's all the glycogen that you need to store. But if you're two weeks out and you start putting on four or five pounds, uh, for most people, that's probably not, not necessarily good. That's not the weight you want to be putting on. Cause it's probably not muscle mass. It's probably other stuff. So, um, just want to be careful with that. Yeah, definitely uh, some art with with keeping that eating to the day, but uh, that's a that's a good point. Like you know, a lot of times people think so much about again just that volume, and there's the, the c- components of intensity and whatnot as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have problems with people being nervous about the amount of intensity? You know, you said you dropped it a bit, but I'll, I'll see some people. You know, they're nervous and they want to just cram all the training in, which is one problem. But then also you'll see people who like basically don't want to do anything in the week right. of the marathon and it's right. like well the you know the, the actual point of a taper is that you're you're sharp and you're you're ready to run right you're familiar with running but we've cut out some of that fatigue um you know but it's, it's certainly not to lay in bed and, and be right. easy right? right i i think uh honestly the people who are already overtrained are the people who freak out, right? They're the ones that are like, "Oh my gosh, I need to rest everything. I need to rest everything," because because they're already they're already done and they already know they're done. Um, so they're the ones that probably struggle the most with it. But overall, I'd say most people are pretty good. Um, the biggest thing I always get though is like, I'll have them run, you know, three miles or thirty minutes, whatever's less, um, the day before the marathon, and a lot of people will freak that freak out with that, but. The way I look, the way I look at it is, one, the freshness thing. It's actually going to make you feel a little bit better. Um, but that's the thing that bothers, the thing that bothers me is they'll they'll complain about the thirty minute run, but they'll go spend four hours in the expo on their feet. Right. But I'm like, okay, uh, but uh, no. So if you run the thirty minutes and you get in, get your stuff from the expo, and get back to your hotel uh, you'll be fine. Um, and so a lot of times people want to switch out, but I set that up because a lot, usually it's two days before that they're traveling. So I'll just give them that day off, get a nice little shakeout jog the next morning and then, 
and then you're well on your way. So, but a lot of times I'll get I'll get some flack on that. Like I'm not running the day before the marathon. It's like okay, you whatever you want. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, so much of it is is that lifestyle piece, right? And it's certainly the clients I work with. You know, the so much of the peak is actually just pulling out the you know as much of the work stress and you know maybe even getting to the race a, a day early so you can you know be in bed and you know not that the kids are in the way but you know decrease some of the running around with the kids and yeah like that, right and, and yep. that's sort of the working person's peak is um you know often very much uh i guess ahead or more important than any of any sort of running or lack of running you can do yeah absolutely and that, and that is a good that's a that is a key component i mean you know, having a supportive family is, is huge. And, you know, just, you know, if it's important for, for you and important for your spouse, hopefully people have that, uh, support from them where they'll let you know, the spouse or whoever will be able to be willing to take on a little bit more for you that last, that those last four or five days and just kind of let you settle in. But, uh, yeah, I know a lot of my, (laughs) my business folks will actually just plan on taking some vacation, like, four days before so that they can just fly out early and get out there because then they can actually get some sleep or not be hassled all the time. But, um, yeah, so it definitely, yeah, it definitely makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I, like I said, I don't want to keep you too long Luke, but that's, that's awesome. It's been super fun talking to you. Um, and, and I think some really practical things people can take here uh, as they get running, uh, whether that's just for the off season or if they're sort of building towards goals, uh, and we'll link to all your websites and, and Twitters and the links you've provided today and then also certainly to your book. Uh, mm-hmm. Was there anything you want to leave people with or, or something you definitely want them to check out? Uh, no, I think, you know, yeah, definitely check out the website. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of stuff about everything we do, but a lot of blog posts that we talk about. Some of the things we talked about briefly here we go pretty in-depth with. So, um, but, yeah, I think uh, – I think if you if you want to run a marathon and, and you want to learn how to train, uh, then then our book's going to be a really good fit for you. Um, you know, if you're looking just to do a one off, uh, we'll definitely be there for you. But I would say we're, you know, my goal with my coaching and in, in, in the books and everything was really to learn to teach people how to learn how to train and take it with them as they go. Um, because so many people that we work with, they say, I only want to run one marathon you know, and that was 10 marathons ago. So, um, hopefully the bug will bite you too. And, uh, you know, cause you know, obviously as a runner, I want the sport to grow. And, and I think, you know, this is a good intro into that and to, you know, do, you know, this is basically an abbreviated version of what our elites do. Um, so, you know, I think it's a good, it's a good intro into, you know, learning how, how to train for a marathon and do it, and do it well and then perform off of a marathon, not just survive a marathon. So, um, so I guess that's my, that's my sales pitch. So (laughs) awesome. Awesome. So the book is Hanson's first marathon, uh, website at Hanson's coaching services.com. And Luke, thank you very much for. for Thanks so much for tuning into the consummate athlete podcast. Uh, you can check out my stuff over at theoutdooredit.com or by following me on Instagram and Twitter at Molly J. Herford. And you can check out Peter's coaching, training plans, blogs, all that fun stuff over at smartathlete.ca or by following him on Twitter and Instagram at Peter Glassford. And if you want to support this show and other awesome podcasts, please check out wideanglepodium.com for show info, other podcasts, bonus content and to become a donating member so you can get all of that rad behind the scenes content and help keep shows like this on the air. And lastly, if you're enjoying this podcast and all the information that we're bringing to you every single week, uh, do us a solid and pop into iTunes to leave us a rating and review. Takes you about two seconds. You can do it on your computer. You can do it on your phone and it really helps us out. Thanks so much. And we will see you next week.